production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. This time on Broad and High, an Ohio artist gives new life to, well, roadkill. A lot of the stuff we use for raccoons and things like that are actually just blown glass, you know, black bubbles. An army of doll-like dancers hits the stage in Columbus, and a feminist performance that explores a symbol that is wholly unique to women. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi everyone, I'm Kate Quickle and welcome back to Broad and High. Our first story tonight takes us to Cincinnati, where artist Jeremy Johnson likes to meddle with nature. He uses all natural materials that are ethically sourced, which probably means they were hit by a car. His artful taxidermy allows for a lighter look at, well, a darker subject. Well, the work we do is involving taxidermy, and uh, and you know obviously that's the sort of thing that you're not going to find at an art store. So the supplying of of that uh, work, a lot of it is coming from the road. So taxidermy, I guess you know, is is a uh, uh, movable skin is what it uh, literally translates to. And, and what it is, is it's an art form in which you are, you're removing the skin from an animal and replacing the inside with a form, a sculpture. When I was much younger, um, Actually, the reason I, I even moved to Cincinnati was, was to, to go into art school, and I had a, a lot of uh, designs on becoming a medical illustrator. I had all these skins, because you got to be really, really delicate when you're you know, doing dissection. And eventually I figured out that I should probably go ahead and use those in the artwork in some way, instead of just doing 2D, go to the 3D. So I moved on to taxidermy really from a medical illustration um, perspective. What, what we do is, is yeah, we do, we do ethically source things. The things that we're not doing is we're not going out and, and hunting. The work that I'm doing is, it has a, it has a lot of gallows humor in it. There is a lot of uh, comedy in, in a lot of these pieces. A lot of the, the mounts in the taxidermy I make are, are intended to be viewed as, as either intentionally kinetic or intentionally static. Uh, so, so like bone articulations and things like that, they're meant to, to move and teach people, you know, so you can see how, how muscles are, are intended to move and how bones articulate with one another. But in many ways that, that comedy or that uh, sometimes the grotesqueness, grotesqueness of it is intended to really disarm people, um, as open up a gateway in a sense to, to nature itself. Things that gets asked a lot, asked a lot of me is, is uh, how can you stand all the blood and things like that, like all the gore of it. It really isn't actually that uh, that that messy or gory. It actually is a very technical uh, trade. So first, there is the the skinning process. So that means you know removing the skin from from the uh, the, the body. From that, then there's a salting process, which everything has to be dehydrated, and there's a lot of you know sciencey stuff in there. It's not really necessary, but uh, the, the salt basically dehydrates the skin from the inside, rather than than having a forced dry coat on the surface of the skin. We uh, we take all the the fat and and uh, other layers of skin and stuff like that on the inside that that need to be removed for a good tan. 
So that, that, that's at the point in which you're chemically changing the skin. I think the anatomy is, is critically important with all the work I do. And I think um, finding those comparisons between animals and humans is, is really you know, eye-opening. And if I'm altering the anatomy, then it has to be believable. We don't actually use um, pre-sculpted mannequins. But since we're doing a lot more artistically based stuff, we make all of it ourselves. A lot of the stuff we use for raccoons and things like that are actually just blown glass, you know, black bubbles. Well, these are the actual teeth, but then a two-part epoxy clay. Uh, so if we were to do uh, something, actually it would make sense, if we were to do something uh, that's a resin cast, then um, I would use a mold. The, uh, the teeth are fit directly to this sculpture. The uppers will just fall out if I put them there, but <laughs> they fit in there too. I think the most rewarding part of all of it is a deeper understanding in in nature, biology, and anatomy, and physiology. Like the, the, when I think about the the most I don't know um, energetic times that I've had, it's been when something is discovered that uh, just wasn't expected. You can learn more about Jeremy Johnson and his taxidermy projects by liking his Facebook page or following him on Instagram. You can find him at Meddling With Nature. Next up, Anna and the Anadroids. This army of doll-like dancers is the brainchild of Columbus native Anna Sullivan. She started the project back in 2005 and it has since evolved into a dazzling multimedia experience. Anna and the Anadroids were back in Columbus this past spring with their latest stage production about one girl's surreal journey to face her fears. Here's more. So I'm originally from Columbus, Ohio. I've been dancing since I was around 11 years old. I started dancing at a competition studio where we mainly focused on jazz and lyrical and tap. Um, and I was a little behind the other dancers because I hadn't started when I was, you know, three, like a lot of people do. So I started taking ballet classes at Ballet Met, and that really helped um, improve my technique. I went to Ohio University and majored in dance. After I graduated from college, I moved to Columbus and I really wanted to create my own work. You know, I was just really inspired by culture and fashion and just all sorts of, you know, things to create my own, my own project. We would wear elaborate makeup, hence the eyelashes and the big lips and um, cute costumes and wigs and just kind of really trying to exaggerate um, fashion and I think also my, my experience from competition dance, it really made me want to go in that direction of flashy. Um, but at the same time, because I'm academically trained, I wanted to go in the direction of conceptual and you know meaningful work and so I think I really just fused those two those two ideas together to create Anna and the Androids. When I first met Anna, she showed me her work and I really connected to it because I loved the makeup and the kind of really out there thinking that she has, but she's also really um, personal with her emotions on stage and she doesn't hold back and I really connected to that when I watched her videos. And this production um, is probably the, 
height of our understanding of each other and feeling of how we want a show to flow and look. Anna and the Androids is a multimedia dance and aerial experience. And I, we've started using the word experience uh, because there's just so many elements. We've got video, we've got dance, we've got aerial, and now we're even making the music. And so there's so many components that come together to create this fully visual experience. So in this production, Fopavia, um, first it's a play on words. There's the word faux pas, which is a misstep. And then there's the word phobia, which is obviously related to fears and phobias. And, and so I thought it was an interesting thing to create a combination of the misstep, since we are technically stepping, we're dancing, right? So it's the mistake of being afraid, the mistake of living in fear. And I think that we are all at least aware that that is happening in our culture more and more. And it's just becoming more intense as we progress. <laughs> Where am I? It's about a, a girl, Anna, the Anna droid. How did I get here? Who is experiencing these fears and phobias. And oh, you go along on that journey with her sort of in her mind. Am I alone? Am I alone? You know, when you when you see her, it's her thoughts that you're hearing. I feel something coming, moving fast, like a spiral of chaotic energy that pushes me out of the light and blinds my eyes. One of the usual challenges working with dancers is, is always with timing. And um, luckily that um, Anna and I have been collaborating for the past three years, I've kind of got under, started to understand the way dancers move, their timing, how they relate uh, their counting to music. Um, coming from a music background, I count slightly differently than dancers, so um, that's something I had to kind of learn. I really want the audience to feel less isolated and more a part of something. I think that because of the fear-driven culture that we're living in, it tends to make us all feel isolated, which creates anxiety and depression. And I think that within this production, there's a lot of references that people can really grasp where it's like, wow, this person or this character is really feeling this way. I have felt this way, so I'm not crazy. I'm not alone. I think that's what the show is about, and so I'm hoping that that is how the audience is responding to the work. Anna and the Androids will be back in Columbus this April with a performance at the Studio One Theater in the Rife Center downtown. Visit anadroids.com for details. So here's a story about another group of women who are making performance art that speaks to contemporary womanhood. They call themselves The Nine, and their recent project in Orange County, California, focused on bridal gowns. Their ghostly performance is less about weddings or being a bride, and more about the moments that are specifically unique to women. Have a look.
are a group of artists who are all female. Of course, we all believe in equal rights and we're working together discussing what is uniquely feminine. We are interested in femininity and the way I feel is I want to enjoy my femininity. We weren't raised seeing extreme oppression. We know it still exists, but we don't have those visual representations in our own families. I was raised as an equal, of course. Nobody in my family ever told me that I wasn't. Then when I encountered feminism in the bigger picture, I felt like that feminism blocked, left me out because I, I am feminine. And it was like, you know what, back off and let me enjoy my femininity without judging me as weak, inferior, ignorant, or stupid. <laughs> So then the question is, how do we, or can we, embrace femininity and release it from a tradition of bondage? The objects that we pull from our dress, <laughs> right, that we birth, mm -hmm. that they reference either broken dreams or um, future dreams or just our present situation. <laughs> this idea that not only can there be duality, but there could be multiplicity. I'm wearing a man's pants under my, uh, my dress and that's not specifically referencing uh, wearing the pants around the house as they say, but it's basically about empowering yourself as a woman and the idea of the pants reflect upon uh, you know, economic and social empowerment, so almost like for me a metamorphosis, you almost transition from one place to another when you're married. One of the things that made me think about was um, the importance that a lot of cultures like the Middle East and Mexico and a lot of cultures put on, on virginity and how that the white dress is supposed to represent a sexual purity. And I hope that through our performance and through our state of mind and through the way we separate it from, from marriage in a sense and, and make the dress ours and our moment, that we can start to have that white dress symbolize purity of mind and purity of heart as opposed to sexual purity. One of the ways I was thinking about the dress, you know, imbuing it and impregnating it with these sim symbols, essentially, of my life and, and of things that I've observed and experienced, um, and then, you know, sort of birthing them, if you will, but then, you know, actually cutting the dress off and sort of, you are making this cocoon for yourself, your mm -hmm. creativity, your symbolic metaphor is this cocoon, and you can make it however you like in order to, like, emerge forth and, and break free of it and move on, you know, forward and upward to the next thing. Well, that's kind of like our group, the nine, where we're sisters almost like and so so when we come together we become I don't know we can connect with each other mm -hmm. and help one another out for me I mean the whole process has been kind of this like feminine ritual of sisterhood and, and self-exploration in a lot of ways too I mean the way that I start thinking about you know what does it mean to you know lead a feminine existence and what does it mean to lead that now and, and what facets are there and you know woman is a sister and mother and healer and artist and destroyer sometimes too. This next segment is for all you Victoria fans out there. Season two of the hit masterpiece series begins this weekend right here on PBS. Creator and writer Daisy Goodwin tells us how she was able to turn her years of research into the life and reign of Queen Victoria into a highly anticipated TV series. The messenger from Windsor is here. The king breathed his last at 12 minutes past. I will do my best, Papa. She is out of her depth. The strain is too much for her. Victoria came to the throne. She's 18. She's you know, not, you know, she hadn't been educated in the way Elizabeth had. She was pretty much kept a prisoner. I mean, prisoner, but, you know, pretty much under house arrest until she becomes queen. And yet she comes straight out of the trap. She's not scared of anything. She's like, this is who I am. From now on, I wish to be called Victoria. 
Queen Victoria. You know, as a child, she'd been called Alexandrina. You know, her, her mother called her Drina, and she was never called Victoria. Her second name was Victoire, but she was never called Victoria. And then when she becomes queen, she says, you know what, I'm not going to call myself Elizabeth or Charlotte or Mary or Anne or any of these names that are sort of traditionally used for English queens. I'm going to call myself Victoria, which was a made-up name. Nobody was called Victoria. You know, it was just, this was a name that she she liked and she'd made up and she was going to use. And I love the idea that she's, she's used this name, which basically says victory, you know, right from the get-go. And I think that that shows that we've got a girl there who's got a real sense of destiny. And I love that about her, you know, that she's this tiny little thing. She's five foot and she's already saying, I'm going to win. But really, Victoria, I mean, I suppose, and this is very important to say about the series, is, is very solidly based on, on, on the records, on her diaries. I mean, we've got a really amazing sense of who Victoria was because she wrote these incredible diaries, which for every day of her life are, you know, 62 million words. So if you want to know who she is, you, you, you can find it. I mean, that unlike any other English monarch, you know, we know more about Victoria than anybody else. The thing I'm always surprised by is that people always say, yeah, Victoria, old bag and a bonnet. You know, they think of her as this sort of sour-faced old, old woman in black. But actually, I always, I always had this very strong vision of her as this kind of passionate teenager. And that's so different from the Victoria that I think a lot of people have an image of. And so I've always thought of her as that person, as this kind of person brimming with life and sexuality and sort of excitement. You know, I think she was... I think she's just one of those people who, you know, I, I, you know, our current queen, Elizabeth, has this incredibly sort of good public face and you just, you never know what she's thinking. The thing about Victoria is you always knew what she was thinking. We were very lucky to find an actress who was physically right and also, more important, an actress of astonishing range and subtlety. I mean, she, she can do everything, you know, in this, in this, she's got to be a kind of stroppy teenager. She's got to, you know, give birth. She's, she's got to fall in love. I mean, you know, she, she's a miraculous actress. And I think, you know, we were incredibly lucky to get her. I can't think of another actress who could have pulled it off. If I require advice, I will ask for it. It's hard for her to be queen. It's not easy and that she's a fallible, you know, flawed human being, but one that you you ultimately, you know, admire or you care about and you wanted to win. There's this kid standing up to kind of the forces of the establishment. And um, that's not the way we think of Victoria, but if you think of her like that, then she feels very much a, a heron for our times. Well, that's our show. Remember, you can revisit all of our stories at WOSU.org, as well as on the WOSU Public Media mobile app. And be sure to give us a follow on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're taking you out today with music by Ohio-based singer-songwriter Jordan Kirk. He released his latest album, Ragamuffin Parade, this past summer. Be sure to join us back here next week for more great stories on Broad and High. We are at the Wellington School. Uh, I am a math teacher. Uh, I teach in the upper school, so geometry, um, statistics, algebra 2. Um, and I'm also the chess coach here. We're going to do a position today. Position. Give you a position, you're going to play more. Um, when I first started teaching at Wellington, I brought some kids over to one of the tournaments, and one of the section monitors was my old friend from middle school who I had known playing chess. And so we talked for, for about an hour, um, both saying that we wanted chess to be more widespread throughout Columbus. We started a nonprofit uh, to, uh, whose mission is to get students playing, especially from the inner city schools, to play chess. Okay, one other thing is they're going to play with clocks. Each person gets 10 minutes with a five-second delay. Okay. Um, 
I think one of the misconceptions is that that I've heard at least, um, and like from like students, you know, like, oh, I'm like not smart enough to play chess. And I think that that is a total misconception. I think anybody who who is interested in the game um, can, can pick it up. And just like anything else in life, like the more you study and the more you do it, the better you get. Catch Columbus at its creative best on Broad and High, Thursday nights at 8 o'clock on WOSU-TV. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you.